Okay, so thanks everyone for your attention, and, and as Michael said also, we want to thank you um, to USAID for inviting us uh, to this event. It's a great opportunity to share work, the work we're doing, and we're quite honored. So in this presentation, which I'll share with, with Richard, we're going to give you a bit about project background and justification, and that's the why we're doing the project. We'll talk about the CESA initiative, and that's essentially the what we are doing. And we'll talk about the CESA Mechanization and Irrigation Project, or MI. And that's really very much about how we are doing this work with value chains. And then we'll conclude. So you just heard about Bangladesh, and Bangladesh has been spoken a lot about today and throughout the last few days. But it's, it is the most complex little country you will ever visit. It is the size of Wisconsin. It has roughly 165 million people dwelling in it. And this red area is the, the future zone, which is a complex environment full of many agroecologies, problems, and many opportunities. Some of the issues we see as constraints is increasing labor scarcity and cost. Despite the population density, more and more farmers are exiting rural areas for employment in the garment sector, for pulling rickshaw, and for other opportunities. There's yield gaps between what farmers are attaining and what they can attain. In the, the Feed the Future zone, there's roughly 13 million households directly involved in cereal production, but only 50% of them are growing more than one rice crop per year, despite a favorable climate in which they could be growing two crops. Again, problem, but major opportunity. There's limited knowledge and access to new technologies, and interestingly, there's quite a lot of surface water available, but relatively little irrigation development. And policies are aligning at this time that refocuses attention on this area of the country, because up here in the north, which is where much of the irrigation has expanded, there's dwindling groundwater supplies and increasing energy costs for irrigation. So there's an interest in irrigation and what we can do in the south. And I should say that Bangladesh has a monsoon season, so it's a monomobile rainfall pattern. One chance to grow a rain-fed rice crop per year, you're much more constrained when working in the dry season. So the Cereal Systems Initiative for South Asia, or CESA, is, is started as a project, but is really, I think, sort of evolving into a program. Um, the original CESA project worked in India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And it involved four CG centers and was funded by USAID and the Gates Foundation. This has now entered into phase two of the, of the project, and it originally started in uh, 2009. Coming out of that, there's a sub-project that's funded entirely by the Bangladesh Mission, which involves CIMIT, Erie, and World Fish. And this is sort of the core CIMIT, or excuse me, core CISA Bangladesh project. You heard during the previous session about the Erie-led seed scale-up project that evolved also out of CESA. And what we're working on now is the CESA mechanization and irrigation project, which is led by CIMIT. We partner extremely strongly with IDE to meet our aims. This, this slide is important because this is how we conceptualize the projects working together in Bangladesh. We want to seek to have synergies but not duplicate what we're doing in the projects. Here in the core CISA Bangladesh project, which started in 2011, we have a very strong focus on farmers. We have a strong focus and maintain a focus on output markets, training for farmers, improved varieties, things that farmers can do in their own fields. But when you're working in a situation where you have 13 million people involved in cereal production, you can't reach every farmer. So you have to look for a solution that allows you to go to scale. And the model that we're working with is local service provision. And these are essentially farmers who have become entrepreneurs, and in our case are working with irrigation or machineries, to supply services to farmers. And where you have one local service provider, you can scale up and touch, touch 10, maybe 15 farmers. So we focus effort here. However, just focusing on local service providers is not enough. It's a complex situation, and we're essentially analyzing and building and working to leverage critical points and value chains behind this to allow service providers to do their work and then serve farmers at scale. So that's the model that we're working with. The project has three objectives, and the first one is on using decentralized surface water irrigation 
to try to get farmers into growing a second crop per year. And with this, we're working with a very simple technology. It is not rocket science. It's, we're focusing by and large on axial flow pumps. And it's essentially a long tube with a propeller at the bottom that can be driven by an engine, in this case, a two-wheel tractor. And that's important, so I'll come back to that. Um, and, and we're trying to scale this, this up as, as a means to get more people into irrigation. And again, this is important because government policy wants to see people pushing irrigation in the south. Now, as a CG center, we had a lot of questions about this technology when it was brought to us. And it's, it's established actually in Thailand, in Vietnam, in other Delta countries. It's missed Bangladesh by comparison. The reason we were interested is that people were saying this is a fuel efficient technology, but we had to test that ourselves. And in fact, we partnered with our national research partners to test the technology. And what this somewhat complicated graph shows you is that up to lifts of 2.8 meters for axial flow pumps in the color compared to centrifugal pumps, which are also low lift pumps, um, up to that lift height, you're getting a proportionally large amount of fuel savings. So we're delivering more water per unit of fuel that is consumed. We also identified models that don't work well and we can throw those away and go with the most promising ones. After that, we deploy that with local service providers and farmers. And we do this sort of through a bit of an action research program to assess what they like and don't like about the pumps. And we feed this information back to our private sector partners. Now, this is also an important part of the strategy. You don't want to just place pumps everywhere. You want to guide your partners. You want to use science to bring it to bear for, for areas where you actually are meeting your project goals. And so to do this, some of the work we're doing in this area where irrigation is not well expanded is using remote sensing technologies. And we're doing this to actually identify the tracts of land where farmers are not growing a dry season crop. Despite being a small area, it's very hard to travel in southern Bangladesh. So we go to space to actually look at where we want to be pushing the technologies, where we want to be working. We then do irrigation suitability analysis, salinity modeling, elevation modeling, so we understand where exactly these pumps will fit best. And that's the biophysical analysis. We're now starting to work at analyses revolving around looking at household typologies and identifying which kinds of households will have more of a capability to invest in irrigation in these areas and then trying to actually target these people appropriately. And this, as a scientist, really excites me because this is science, this is publishable, this is good, but it's also market information that we can also feed back to our private sector partners. <clears throat> the second objective is broad access to agricultural mechanization services. And to do this, we work on power tillers. And it's basically a two-wheel tractor. Many of you have probably seen these. And this is a power tiller attachment. What's very cool about this is you can take this off, and I can attach this, which is a seed fertilizer drill, to the back of the two-wheel tractor. There's currently around 4, 450,000 two-wheel tractors with power tillers in Bangladesh. No one knows the exact number. The story how that emerged is very interesting, and you can ask me over lunch. But what's important about this is that we've identified a platform of, um, upon which we think we can quickly go to scale by just replacing a part of the technology. And when utilized, in this case under conservation agriculture, which we do quite a lot of work on, we found that typically by reducing tillage and changing the configurations on the attachments, you can get in and plant earlier. You can save soil moisture, you have more precise seed and fertilizer placement, and it's ready-made for a local service provision market. So again, looking at the science of this, this is rainwater efficiency in areas where we cannot bring irrigation, in areas where farmers rely only on the little bit of rain during the dry season that they receive, and yield on the other side. We find when you use the cedar fertilizer attachment, and these data were collected under farmers' own management in the on-farm trials, and you compare it to machine tillage and planting, conventionally using best recommended practices, we're actually getting an increase. And compared to farmers' practices themselves, the increase is even clearer. If you don't want to look at the graph and you want to see what it looks like in the field, this is the comparison of use of this machine for maize and conventional machine tillage and planting. 
And when measuring this, we also find that there is indeed an increase in profitability and a reduction in costs. So we find this as something that should be appealing. Richard's going to take over and explain the next objective. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. Um, yeah, thanks Tim for going through some of the, some of the science side. Uh, one thing uh, to kind of point out that the partnership between Simple and ID is kind of a, it's a, it's a marriage made in heaven uh, in a way, in that uh, Simon obviously have the agronomic research, uh, the kind of information, all, all the things that I don't really understand. And what IDE has, uh, and we can do uh, different to Simba, is we can be quite nimble, uh, we have existing relationships with private companies, which we're going to talk about uh, in a second, um, and we can, we can sort of leverage those core competencies together to, to make the program work. And one thing I would say on uh, on the civic side is what they've done is really take a different approach to this project and really put a strong commitment towards uh, a commercial approach to scaling out these technologies, um, which uh, they don't have to do, um, but they've decided to do because they, they believe that this is the best way to scale up. And that's why you know we're roughly 50-50 in this project. The, the commercial component isn't an afterthought, it's not a bolt-on, it's a core component of the project. And, um, and as any marriage, we do bicker a lot about things all the time. And, uh, I think that's sort of creative uh, in, a, in a way, so that's good. But the third component on public-private partnerships, yeah. Uh, we could probably talk a lot, I mean, we were talking yesterday a little bit about the value of death in technology development and commercialization. That's something we, we think about a lot in Bangladesh. Um, what we're trying to do is also uh, re refine these technologies and optimize these technologies in a way that they can become commercial products. So typically what we would see, and, and one of the um, constraints of the public research system is that they, they tend to have a very technocratic focus on the technologies, uh, and uh, not so much a commercial focus on turning them into products that can be sold through uh, existing commercial channels. So one thing we use is a human set of design approach, which I was also talking about a little bit yesterday. Uh, and very, very broadly, I won't go into too much detail, what uh, human centered design does is, in equal measure, look at the feasibility or the technical side of a particular technology, uh, which of course the research organizations and the, and the government institutions are very strong at. Um, in combination with the desirability of the human factor, why would people want to buy either this technology or why would they want to buy this technology service? Understanding kind of the psychosocial drivers of uh, consumer preference and behavior change that we need to understand. Uh, in order to really uh, sell out these things in a commercial way. Uh, and of course, the viability. Um, for any commercial organization, the viability is, uh, is absolutely um, paramount. So the sweet spot between these things is where the innovation can really scale. And this is something we're going to be using uh, uh, in the second half of this year, a human-centered design process to refine the technologies, working with the public and the private sector together. Um, uh, it'll, it's kind of a win-win for both if we can get these things scaled out. Okay. Going backwards. Okay. So on the commercial side, um, from ID's point of view, what we had to really do was assess the market for these agro machines. We did a um, a, a study uh, a couple of years back on selected agro machineries, and and really found uh, in terms of analysing the market for uh, the seed and fertilizer attachment, just as an example, in order for this attachment to really be adopted and really be taken up uh, at scale by local service providers investing their own money in buying it, not being given away or dropped from a helicopter like uh, we could have done, we decided not to. For that really to work, you need support services. This would be mechanic services, uh, access to finance, access to spare parts, things like that. Um, we also identified that this local service provider model was a, a good way to scale up and to use uh, Richard's terms that I think we're all trying to use more and more as this uh, glee has gone on. It's about grafting onto an existing pathway uh, to get adoption. So the local service provider model was there. For tilling services, we can graft this cedar attachment onto that existing modality. Uh, and also we were able to uh, get a rough estimate of the size of the market, which when we approach a commercial partner, that's something they're interested in. We're, we're approaching companies and selling them on a, a business proposition as opposed to a, a social impact, which is uh, the way we might report back to our donors and our, and our project partners. But really for the businesses, uh, at least in Bangladesh and the, the national companies we're working with there, it's, uh, it's a business proposition. Okay. So what we did was we uh, very deliberately worked with large uh, lead firms in Bangladesh to scale up these technologies. One of the main reasons for this is 
these large firms have uh, quite wide uh, dealer networks and distribution channels already in existence after sales service capability. Uh, so they can really provide the kind of services to um, lead to these technologies not only being adopted but also sustained in the field. So RFL group, I won't go into all the details. They have tons of uh, factories, I think 24 factories in Bangladesh, um, over 5,000 employees, uh, 300 million, excess of 300 million US dollars in revenue. Uh, advanced chemical industry, ACI, uh, I think formerly known as ICI. Um, similar, uh, they're um, probably with a longer history in farm mechanization than, than RFL. So deliberately harnessing these large uh, scale agents in order to drive through uh, the objectives of the project. So to briefly explain, there, there's been a lot of talk about um, knowing who you have to influence to make something happen at, at policy levels, at private sector levels. And we did this very deliberately. We had to figure out who are the players that we need to make friends with if we want to make this work. You can't just drop 1,200 pumps in southern Bangladesh and expect people to pick them up and everything to function. We very deliberately instead went the wrong way. We went the right way. We figured out who we needed to show the technologies to, to convince them to buy in. So that included the chairman of the Department of Agricultural Extension, the chairman of the Parastatal that we work with, the head of the research system, the deputy mission director, private sector partners, and one geeky scientist, which we all put on an airplane, flew to the field, leaving at nine in the morning, showed all the technologies functioning under farmer management in their fields, got them back on the airplane and in their office by 2 p.m later in the day. And that visit changed things. It sent a message up to the Minister of Agriculture who learned about what we were doing and it created a space for us to actually fill and improve this kind of work. We followed up with a visit here to Thailand and this was a study visit to axial flow pump factories who were making this irrigation technology. I went to see what I could learn about the engineering, the use of the technology. We also brought our private sector partners who were interested in starting to import and wanted to actually verify the market size in Thailand, which has similar similarities to Bangladesh in terms of the lift requirements for irrigation. Um, the pumps are also widely used, I should say, to give props to Michael for fisheries, which was a, a secondary interest of our partners. We then signed a, an umbrella agreement with RFL, one of the companies we're working with, and that agreement did not focus only on this project, CISA MI, but this was signed with IDE, and it was designed basically to give them a space to buy into the many projects that they're working with because IDE has expertise in leveraging value chains and companies recognize that. At the same time, research was ongoing, technology tweaking was ongoing. And this is important to point out here. This is when the project's funding began in July of 2013 for this part of the CISA project. So in order to line things up, you have to start very early. You have to plan ahead. And why did we do this? Because it's only at the end of the chain here in November when irrigation is necessary in the field, when it starts to open up. So to do all that work, we had to start nearly a year in advance. And we had to take the risk in advance of the funding to do all of these efforts to line up everything and get our ducks in order to make the project function. It was at that point that the commercial agreement was signed with the company and RFL has now begun marketing the pumps. And this is important also because they have invested in the project and taken the risk to market the pumps. It is not the project marketing pumps to farmers. We have them doing all of that work, which we hope will be a more durable and sustainable pathway after we pack up our bags and go home from doing this. Richard will now explain the nuts and bolts of how this, the business models work. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so I think the important part of that was that we had to really establish trust and confidence in the side of the, pri the private sector because, uh, I mean, we see a lot in Bangladesh. Typically, uh, there's, there's a bit of a pressure now on development organizations to bring the private sector uh, as, and be involved in projects, but uh, very often the role of the private sector is as a component of that project. And the pitch from the development organization to the CEO or whatever company they're talking to is, we're doing a development project, you're going to be part of it. And then it's all about us. It's all about our project and our objectives. But really, the pitch uh, that we made to RFL was all about them. We, we can get a little bit of uh, social return on investment capital. We can do a joint venture with you in your investment in agricultural machineries. And that's, that's a key distinction, which 
Uh, we're starting to see a bit more in emerging practice of people doing that in biology, but by and large, uh, it, it's not like that. So I think we're, we're doing something a little different there. Okay, just thinking about the, the very basically the, the value chain here then. We've, we've got for these uh, axial flow pumps, uh, we've got a source of the pumps where they're manufactured actually in Thailand um, to begin with. Then we've got RFL, we've got a dealer uh, network here, we've got sales offices through to a local service provider who's the customer for the technology. So this is the, uh, the person that's going to buy the technology and invest their money up front. The farmer is the customer for the service. So we've got to, in order for the local service provider to be viable, they have to recoup the cost of their investment through selling services to farmers. So we have to think about, on the demand side, both the viability of the farmer as it, and its influence on the viability of the business model of that local service provider. So some of the interventions we made uh, from CISA MI, we uh, took supply side interventions, this is the joint ventures we've been talking about, uh, a number of, of areas of that. Uh, we undertook a consumer promotion, uh, this is a discount model, now, it could be seen as a, as a small subsidy. It's about 4,000 taka uh, as in uh, a market retail price of the axial flop. And there are eight models ranging from 15,000 up to 30,000 taka. So it's a pretty sizable discount. Um, the, crucially, we're dropping that in at the top end with RFL, is that in the field, that's seen as a promotional discount by RFL, which they would do on any of their new product lines that they're launching. So the first 800 units are discounted but what that does is protect the market retail price for RFL later. So if you bring a technology in at, a, at an artificially subsidized price, it's then established in the market at that price, it's very difficult then for the commercial sector to come in later and sell at a higher price. So this is something we've had to really uh, understand about RFL's business model. Um, other, idea, other things we're doing, rural marketing and promotion, we undertook 90 demonstrations, we had two trucks running around the field. This was all led by RFL but paid for by us, by CISA MI. Um, we also hired a commission-based sales team where we covered the base salary of the sales agents, there are 20 sales agents, and the commissions come from uh, RFL's uh, dealer network and RFL system. Uh, we also uh, provide support on developing their after-sales service for the company. Okay. On the demand side, again, looking at this nexus between the local service provider and the farmer, we've really got to make the farmers demand these services in order for the local service providers to uh, feel that they can risk this investment in buying a new machinery. So we're doing a lot of work here in terms of building the access to of the local service providers to farmer groups. This is the CISA groups, obviously, that uh, are already mobilized in existence, but also other platforms and other farmer groups from development projects or, or government initiatives or, or even just farmers associations that exist in the field. Um, we'll, we're trying to broker those relationships at the moment. Um, we're building the capacity of the local service providers through uh, training of the trainers. Uh, this is uh, initially coming from the project, but we have a view in the long term that this will come from uh, the government uh, extension services. Uh, and we're also creating these farm business advisors, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, but essentially what they will do is replace the project uh, in terms of this business brokering and local level um, demand aggregation service, which the, the project is currently doing Farm business advisors will be a, a local commission-based agent that can take over that role. Uh, we've done a lot of work on this in, in our Cambodia program and in other places in ID. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about FBAs, I can talk about it later, but I won't use up the whole presentation now by talking about it. Uh, and also what we're doing is thinking about the supporting services, which we identified in our, in our analysis. We've got to understand how we can, we can build those services sustainably and that they can support this value chain. So thinking about those services, we have the, the value chain here. Um, what are the services we identified? Whether they're testing and, and technology development and refinement services, obviously the mechanic services, the agronomic advice services, and the financial services. So looking at the, at the system, who are the players that can really uh, deliver these services? Well, obviously mechanics, local mechanics, uh, as SAOs, our subassistant agricultural officers, basically the frontline extension agents for the government, uh, and financial services providers down at the bottom. So who influences a lot of these um, uh, service providers, well, obviously the government department, so the government research institutes, uh, the government development corporation, the government extension service. So what can we do? Well, we can work through the research institute um, to work on this human centered design approach through the PPP uh, and, and get machinery optimization through these processes. We can work with the development corporation to certify and train mechanics uh, and hopefully continue to do that after we're gone. 
uh, which they can supply to the OSP. We can work with the extension services um, through to increase the uh, agronomic advice through the frontline development workers and through the farm business advisors uh, to ensure that farmers, farmer businesses are viable, making the LSP business viable, which should increase and perpetuate the system of technology adoption. And you know, lastly and very importantly, we can work with financial service providers to uh, invest in this uh, supply chain and provide uh, financial products which will enable the LSPs to take up these technologies. We, in IDE, we have an existing relationship with a number of financial service providers that we work with on developing new products and services for different value chains. And also, crucially, USAID have a, a program with Bragg Bank in Bangladesh too on leveraging investment for agricultural mechanization. So it's, it's ideal and, and we're pursuing a, a partnership with them too. Okay, Tim. So getting to the end, where, where are we with this process? Again, the project began six months ago. Um, in, in that six months time, we've managed to secure roughly 3.5 to 1 investment, private sector versus project sector, to actually scale up the technologies. And we see that actually as a quick win and a success, that the companies that we're working with are taking large financial risks to see the technologies deployed. And that's been important in the context of Bangladesh, because as many of you know, it has not been an easy year to work in Bangladesh. We're, we're facing a lot of problems. We've lost more than 90 working days this year due to risks, general strikes, uh, threats of political violence. In many cases, projects have had to shut down entirely. But our private sector partners who have taken this investment have continued to push as hard as they can, despite, for example, Richard and I not being permitted to actually go to the field. So we've had an obstacle in terms of the political situation, but the partnerships we've developed have been, in fact, an advantage. At this point, 1,200 pumps have been imported from Thailand, and they're being sold through the RFL distribution network. An entire consignment of cedar fertilizer drills, which has a similar but, but tailored business model that compared to what Richard described, have been sold completely, and they're in the process of being used for planting right now. Um, and, and, and we see these as things that are quite successful and we're optimistic despite the difficulties that we face this year. Now, finally and importantly, um, everybody's sort of been asked to talk a bit about failures and constraints, and I personally feel like we haven't been honest enough in, in this last three days about the difficulties that we face. So I do want to, emperor bears no clothes sort of situation, say that this has not been a perfect process. It's been difficult. One thing that we've learned very strongly is that we have to be willing and able to adapt the models as they come. Private sector will have a different agenda, it may shift. We have to have a discussion, we have to move with that quickly. You can't build a recipe at the beginning of the project and follow it through to the end. You probably have to revisit it, it, it on a monthly basis, which is a headache and time consuming, <coughs> but very, very necessary. Some of the machineries that we've been working with require a little bit more optimization, and we're doing this through the human-centered design process this year. Again, for me as a researcher who likes to tinker with these things, that's very exciting, actually. But it does require time to get things right. And, and finally, and I think very importantly, we're working in a commercial model that is night and day different from what a lot of development organizations in Bangladesh do. In many cases, many of our senior field staff have worked for FAO, they've worked for other organizations. Don't name names, Tim, don't well, name names. That, that, that in many cases do asset transfer projects. And we've done something that is markedly different. And it, it is indeed a challenge to get people both at the private sector to think about working with a development organization differently, and also within our own projects, getting some of our senior leadership to understand the models that we're working with, come around to them, and actually become advocates of them. But when they do, when those very senior level people who have spent their careers working in the field in Bangladesh see the value of this and speak for it to their colleagues, the effect is actually quite profound and, and we find that encouraging. So in summary, the, the sort of traditional mode of projects directly procuring equipment and supplying it to farmers or a project going directly to a dealer and then doling it out to farmers is probably not enough to reach scale, but more importantly, to make it last after the project concludes. 
The models that we're trying to work for that concentrate on building the value chain in such a way that it's self-sustainable and focusing on local service providers who are investing in the technologies and want to recoup their investment on the technologies by selling services to farmers who demand them and project linking them with farmers who are enabled to pay for them is something that we think will basically scale up the system through a value chain and enable longer term sustainability. But you can come back to me in five years when we're finished and ask exactly where we are. And if you can find us. We'd love to come back here and speak about that. So with that, if you have any questions, we're happy. And again, thank you to USAID for both trusting in the project and the models that we're working in and also inviting us to speak. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.